hey, greetings to all and welcome to this McCarter at Home event. McCarter at Home is McCarter Theater Center's virtual programming from Princeton, New Jersey in the US. And its goal is to bridge the isolation gap and be a source of light and art and culture and human connection during these times. My name is Paula Alexson and I am McCarter's Artistic Engagement Manager and it's my great pleasure to moderate the McCarter Live In Conversation series. And what a great pleasure to have special guest Cynthia Nixon, actor of stage and screen and activist uh, back at McCarter, virtually at least, <laughs> to be in conversation with McCarter Artistic Director and resident playwright Emily Mann, an activist in her in her own right. So thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, it's great to be here. Great to be here, Paula. So you should know that we have local, regional, and na a national audience today. And there are a few folks zooming in from Canada and Mexico, South America, and various European <laughs> localities. Um, we're also streaming live on Facebook. So greetings to our Facebook viewers. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, and a special thanks as always to those who submitted questions. Now, Cynthia, um, we've been opening these McCarter Live in Conversation events um, with Emily um, and our special guests with a quarantine sort of like current moment check-in. So could you share with us from where you're Zooming in, with whom you're quarantined, and how it, it's going for you in sort of personal day-to-day -day experience? Yes, so I am coming to you from uh, my, my apartment in New York City in Manhattan. Downtown, there actually seems to be a helicopter kind of overhead right now. <laughs> um, my wife and I are here with our nine-year-old Max and our 17-year-old goes back and forth every few weeks between our house and his dad's house. And we have our, our trusty cat, Aurora, who is a great comfort animal to all of us. <laughs> That's wonderful, thank you. Um, how are things, uh, your day-to-day? Has it been an adjustment? Are you? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say there has been a lot of homeschooling, <laughs> um, you know, which has a few pluses, but it, it, I think it's a real stressor for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so a lot of our day is taken up with that. Right. Um, and then we're doing, you know, various you know, political, political things, political candidates that we're supporting and um, lots of, of we're, we're planning a big fundraiser for this weekend and a lot of different candidates that we're finding ways to virtually support because of course you can't go knock on doors and you can't throw events at people's houses or, um, or so many of the other uh, usual political things you would be doing with this election coming up right now in New York on, on June 23rd. Well, we'll signal boost that event at the end. How about sure. that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Emily, um, could you share a quick word for those who haven't joined in this regular Friday series, a little bit about your uh, quarantining? Um, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, um, I am still here in our house in Princeton uh, with my husband. Um, and uh, I was just sharing this with Cynthia earlier. Um, some of you know it was a very hard adjustment for me at first. I'm finding, though, great uh, joy and hope uh, amid some of the heaviness and darkness, uh, knowing um, all of the losses um, and pain out there. We are um, finding a lot of uh, harmony and joy just uh, being home and nesting and cooking and I'm writing up a storm. I'm writing two new plays, um, wrote uh, as Cynthia did, uh, write, uh, direct and act in a 24 hour monologue. I wrote one of those uh, just recently and I'm doing lots of little projects um, with monologues right now um, with both on guard arts and now crossroads theater company um, so i'm i'm feeling very um creative uh, artistically and then of course when we have some of the national tragedies we're going through um and of course minneapolis means a great deal to me i i lived there for many years um 
there's a lot going on in our country um, besides the pandemic, um, exacerbated in some ways by the pandemic, but also the pandemic is signing such a huge Klieg light on, on what's uh, going on with uh, the inequities in our society in a new way. So like Cynthia, from home, I'm doing what I can do on that score. Um, I definitely want to feature the 24-hour um, plays project and your work um, on it uh, a little bit later. But let me give you a sense of the conversational journey and to the folks at home. So I've curated a journey that's going to look back into the theatrical past to sort of highlight your career, how your career journeys intersected. Um, uh, and then I'd love to touch a bit, uh, on Cynthia, on your expansion of your theater artistic work into directing. Um, I'm eager to hear you both talk about the art of directing. Um, and also we'll pivot into a conversation about your ind individual formations as political beings and activists. Um, and uh, then we'll talk about the effect of COVID-19 crisis on your artistic work and thinking. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with those projects that we definitely want to signal boost so folks can um, check them out. Uh, I always like to say, if you at all feel like you'd like to deviate from that journey, feel free at any time. Um, and certainly your follow-ups should be privileged. So I will also note uh, the Zoom webinar chat is open. So if any folks who are in the Zoom room um, want to make comments about um, the conversation, um, add some questions and I'll try to sneak them in whenever I can. I've already incorporated some questions from the folks uh, registering who submitted questions. So hopefully we'll get a nice uh, mix of questions. So uh, Cynthia, Emily knows that I'm passionate about theater origin stories. Um, so I'd love to hear you talk about uh, your first exposure to theater, what it meant for you. I know you have a really long life and career in the you theater. really do. And I very really few do. people can share the origin story that you can. So if you don't mind, please do. Sure. So my mother had been an actress before I was born. She, um, she majored in it in college and she went to Yale Drama School. Uh, she studied with Uta Hagen in New York and she tried for many years to be an actress and really didn't have any success at it. Um, so she quit and then she had me, luckily for me. And for <laughs> Um, and uh, so I think that, you know, really my earliest memories, she took me to an awful lot of, of, of movies and old movies and particularly plays. Um, I mean, I feel like the first, you know, Shakespeare I remember was I was six and we saw Stacey Keach and James Earl Jones in, uh, in Hamlet. Oh, wow. um, uh, so by the time I was, so I was really chomping at the bit to start acting. I mean, I was really pretty well indoctrinated. Um, <laughs> so I really started acting when I was about 11 or 12, depending on what you, what you count. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was very, I tried to keep my expectations really low that this was just something I was doing for now in order to pay for college. Um, but, and I thought, oh, I'll just do commercials or something. But luckily for me, the commercial people didn't really want me. I was sort of a little too strange and individual. And so right away, I found, I found myself to wonderful, wonderful directors and wonderful projects. And so my mother was definitely my first and most important teacher. And she worked with me, you know, until she, until she died in 2013. Um, but certainly I learned so much along the way from, from the other actors and from the, the amazing directors that I got to work with. Um, Emily, is there anything relatable in Cynthia's story? Well, um, sure. Um, I, I always thought that I started so, so late because I always think of, of Cynthia as, as basically acting from the time she was out of the womb. Uh, but I didn't start that much later. I, I, I Freshman year in high school, I got a crush on a boy who was in the, you know, the school play. And so I went to watch rehearsals and I was told that, you know, if if I worked on the production, I could go to the cast party. So I worked on the production. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I fell madly in love with the theater and it's never stopped. I mean, the, the, the uh, crush on the boy ended, but not uh, the crush on the theater. And so... I started from sweeping the stage to doing props to doing makeup to 
doing costumes. Finally, the teacher said, why don't you try acting? I fell in love with acting. And then at 17, he said, why don't you try directing? And then boom, everything came together. So, um, but I didn't, unlike Cynthia, know that that was anything you did as a profession. I thought it was just something you loved. So it took me quite a while to figure out that this was going to be my life. I knew it was going to be my love, but I didn't know it was going to be my life until um, late in college when I discovered it could be, yeah. Um, Emily and folks in the audience, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, but Cynthia was recently interviewed for the new group's Why We Do It series um, by artistic director Scott Elliott. It's available on YouTube. Um, you should look it up. It's a great interview. Um, and it really goes deep into your relationship with the new group and also you tell so many wonderful stories. Um, but in it, Cynthia offers that um, she thinks in musical comedy. She says, I love Shakespeare and Ibsen and Chekhov, all those folks, but I love musical theater more. Um, I wonder, Emily, well, I'd love to hear you, you talk about that idea of thinking in musical comedy. Um, Cynthia, and then I'd love Emily to tell us if there's a genre of dramatic art that she thinks mm -hmm. of. Um, so, yeah, I just, I feel like um, uh, musicals are, are, you know, one of our greatest American art forms. And they're so, they're so American. We have, we've put such a stamp on them. Um, and I, I feel that my, my passion for musical comedy and my knowledge of it is, is only matched by, like, I'm not an opera buff. I know very little about opera. But the kind of uh, fanaticism that I see for people who love opera and like feel the music move through them and, and feel that they are those characters when they're listening, for me, it is, it is like that. It is like that with musical comedy, and I, I there is just something about. Um, I mean, this is true, I guess, of all all kinds of writers, whether you're writing poetry or you're writing novels. But I love the way composers of musical comedies are always stealing from each other and responding to each other and trying to tear down. You know, no, that you were wrong. This is the right way, um, and just the way in which a song. Most, you know, of course there are duets and there are group numbers, but you know, most songs in musical comedies are solos. And I just think that we have honed the craft of that so much so that they're just some of the most beautiful um, monologues and character studies um, mm -hmm. that we have. And I think that's why I love it so much because you know, people always ask me, what kind of music do you listen to? And it's like, oh, it's so embarrassing. It's like musical comedy <laughs> and folk music, you know, folk music with a political bent. Do you, do you know what I mean? Because I like, I like a theatricality in my, in my music. And certainly, certainly musical comedy has that. Um, I don't want to leave the question about um, the genre that tells your story, Emily, but I don't know if Cynthia knows that you're working on a musical right now. She probably does it. Yeah, <laughs> I am. I'm having such a ball. Wow. Is um, this your first musical that you've done? It's actually my second, but I, the first one where I'm the sole book writer. Yeah. Wow. Um, the first one was a, uh, um, uh, an African-American um, musical by, uh, that I co-authored with Entozaki Shange way back in the late wow. 80s. Um, and I haven't since. But Lucy Simon called me and Lucy, you know, wrote Secret Garden, is a composer for Secret Garden, and and uh, her sister is Carly Simon, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, she said, I, I'm just dying to work with you. And and, and I thought, what? Well, thank you, but but in <laughs> what way? <laughs> she said, Well, I think you, we, you, I want to write the music, and you should write the book of a musical. And I thought, Okay, but that's not what I'm known, known for, right? So it was just, so she said, I don't care. I just love how you write and please. So we started to look for a property and it's Our Souls at Night. It's a wonderful novel by Kent Haruf and it's a love story. And she's writing the, um, 
uh, I'm writing the book and she's writing, uh, she's composing and Susan Birkenhead just come on for the oh. lyrics and Ted Sperling and Vicki Clark are working with us as director. I mean, it's just wow. a dream. Wow. And I wake up every morning just aching to get to work. And so we're having a blast. Um, and I know what you mean. I, I'm thinking, why did I wait so long? And, you know, and then I always wanted to direct more of them and then the money got in the way and I, you know, and I felt, oh, well, I haven't done it as much as everyone else. So now I can't start now and so and all that. So, but I know, I understand why you love it so much. I mean, it's, it makes sense. Have you directed one or have you? No, I do. I've only directed three things, but one of them that I directed was kind of, for me, the best of both worlds so far, which was I directed a play called Steve which was about six people, five men and one woman who were all gay. And they were kind of all failed musical comedy performers. And so <laughs> everything in their life is a musical comedy <laughs> reference. It's the way in which literally they understand the world. And so I directed it for Scott Elliott at his theater, the new group, and he was really, even though I was very afraid to do it, he really encouraged me, he said, Start the evening out while the audience is coming in. Get a get a piano on stage, and a lot of the people we cast were also musical comedy people. And let them let them riff. Of course, you know we'll choose the songs and everything, but that that are like great great set pieces, and also in some way relate to the uh, the themes of the play. So for me, that was like a kid the candy store to be able to. And we work with Seth Rudesky, who, who helped us. And, um, and it just was such a great addition. It started everybody off in the right, on the right foot. And you never get yeah. to see these people sing, but you, you do in the, in the curtain raiser. So no, I have not directed a musical, but I've directed a show about musical comedy people. Got it. So that's and the next step. I thought somebody asked in the chat, if I sing in musicals, I do not. <laughs> I would love so much if I did. The only uh, time, I've only sang in public twice. I said, well, one wasn't really public. One was Sarah Jessica Parker's 40th birthday and Mark Shaman and I worked together on a version with my own lyrics of I've grown accustomed to her face. Oh. Which was delightful to do, and then and then when the public theater was having its I don't know 60th anniversary maybe a few years back, they called me and said, you know, is there a song from the public's history that you would like to do? And I didn't even have to think twice. I I was like, dance ten looks three every day in my living room from like ages nine <laughs> to fifteen. You know, like so. It was one of the scariest things I've ever done, but I did it. Quick for you. Yeah. I would give my right arm to be able to <laughs> sing. Oh my God. I know, I know, oh. I know. Um, Cynthia and Emily, um, when and how was it that you first became aware of one another as artists? Gosh. Oh gosh. I mean, I feel like I've known about Emily for a long time, but I don't remember what it was was i mean i certainly yeah when same. i got the opportunity to work to work with her in 96 mm -hmm. i i jumped at it so i already i mean i already knew who she was but i yeah. i'm not sure why i knew mm -hmm. i mean i can't remember yeah same but i think i mean because i'm in the years merge when, when you did the Tom Stoppard, how, how old were you? Yeah, I, when was, I was that? I was 17 and 18 in that. So that was like 84. Yeah. So I know I knew you. I, we hadn't met, but I knew your work then. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's a long time. I mean, definitely in the 80s. Yeah. So yeah. by the time I asked Cynthia to do, to do, um, I was going to say streetcar, to do um, uh, Doll's House, that was... I know, known a long time. I'd watched your work forever. Yeah. Did you know yeah. when um, you chose that for uh, the 95, 96 season of McCarter that it was going to be a play that Cynthia would be in? Or was it, um, was it chosen first? Um, it was chosen first. It was going to be the third time I did it. I and was Jerry in love with that play. 
and Jerry did a new translation. Jerry, yeah, my ex-husband did the translation. Did the translation. And so that's the first Barry two, Bannon. yeah, Jerry Bamman. And the first two I did with Mary McDonnell mm -hmm. and Jerry playing Torvald. Um, so the first time I did it was I was I was quite young, and we were at, went out to Oregon with Andre Gregory and Wally Sean and Jerry and Mary. We had an incredible summer. That was the first time, and I had just gotten married. Um, the next time was at Hartford, stayed with Mary and David Strathairn and Mark Lamos played Dr. Ronk wow. and Janet Zarish played um, uh, Christine and Mary was in it again. And I just had a child. And so- You had just had a child or Mary? Yeah. You had just had a child. Jerry and I had just had a child, yeah. Right. So that was, I suddenly, the, the, the whole place was a mess and had toys everywhere. And I hadn't quite gotten that element before deeply enough in the first production. And then when I directed it here with Cynthia, I was recently divorced. Uh -huh. And that brought another understanding of the play to me. Um, was so that each production was very different, but when I decided to do the third one, I just knew I needed to do the play, and then I thought of Cynthia. But I didn't, I didn't go to Cynthia and say, "Do you want to do the play first? I had decided I, I desperately needed to do the play again, and then Cynthia seemed to desperately want to do it with me. So that's how it happened. Cynthia, had you had any previous experience with Ibsen or the play A Doll's House before? Um, um, no. So I, you know, I, um, my mother never really took me to any Ibsen that I can remember. I guess we watched Lee Ullman on TV and stuff. Right. Um, but I, rem I read him, uh, some of him in high school and I really didn't like him. <laughs> I was like, nobody talks like this. Nobody in the world talks like this. This is the stiffest stuff I've ever heard. Yeah. And then when I was like 23, I guess, I performed in the Master Builder at Hartford Stage with Mark Lambert. Right. Oh, amazing. Right. That's great cast. I, oh, see, that's another way. Yeah, that's right. Right. And I, yeah, I, I knew those. about that. Yep. And so it was completely eye-opening to me because I thought, oh, well, this stuff doesn't really flow off the tongue, but it's so dense and it's so, you know, it's not, it's not snappy dialogue, but it gets right to the heart of everything, psychology and uh, politics and everything. Yeah. So, um, and I, so I had, it was really interesting to me because I had always assumed before I, Emily offered me Doll's House, I had always assumed that I was a Hedda and not a Nora. I didn't think I was a Nora at all. Wow. Um, yeah. And That's the first time I think you've told me that. And I was wrong. I was really <laughs> you wrong. You were so I wrong. Was really wrong. So, I mean, when this came, I mean, out of the blue, I just, I couldn't believe it. And I, and I jumped at the chance. You know, Cynthia, I wonder, and em Emily, I'd love for you to speak to this, that sometimes, um, sometimes it's a bad translation. <laughs> yes. You know, especially yeah. um, in high school and college, if the professor's just sort of, you know, uh, ordering a general text, or they are using what they have, they, you don't get to see the word sing on the page. And we have so much British, we have so yeah. much British Ibsen, yeah. and so much British uh, Yakov. Yakov, Oh, it just, it just quite, surprise it, yeah. Yes, so I did wonder if the Bamman um, and Berman translation was something, Emily, I mean, you obviously knew the, the folks that were translating it, yeah. but if there was something special about the translation that you were, that you were, you were working with and that you, were, uh, you ended up working um, with as well, Cynthia. I also note that um, the production title um, in the record is right. Dollhouse. Yes, and that's right. I wondered right. if um, that speaks to the production or if that speaks to the, tran the uh, translation. That, that's the correct translation. 
Okay. It is a dollhouse. Irene Berman is a Norwegian native speaker, and she says, you know, all the English translations of the title are wrong. And the thing that was brilliant about it and really helped me find my way into the play was um, a doll house. It's not her house. She's, She's not, not the a doll. doll with a house, right? Everyone right. is these. Everyone in it has been trapped in this dollhouse of what they're supposed to be. So for me, the tragedy of the play was as much Torvalds as mm -hmm. um, as Nora's, mm -hmm. and everyone's in it. And then what the society had done, and that that is, I think, what Ibsen had in mind, actually. Um, but do, do you remember the first day of rehearsal, there was Cynthia not only gave a surprising reading in that it was a brilliant first reading, but she also surprised me with well, so, something so else. What happened was I was in Los Angeles. I can't remember what I was doing there, but I was doing something. And Emily, Emily had a very busy schedule. So rather than go right into rehearsal when we were supposed to, we had like a four day workshop or something to sort of get ahead of it. Right. right, you remember this? Right, I do. So I flew out, we had a great time. Then in the cast, I don't know if you remember this, but um, Dennis O'Hare was in the cast originally. Right, he was. And Chris, I can't remember Chris's name right now. He was in Mad Forest. Do you remember Chris? I can't think of his name. Yes, yes, no, no, gosh, yes. And uh, so we all sat around the table and we all read it. We had a great time. Uh, we were so excited. Was, and then Jennifer Van Meyerhauser, who was going to do the clothes, who did the clothes, was there to take our measurements and have a brief conversation with them. At which point I said, this is so great. By the way, I should tell you, I am pregnant. Oh. <laughs> so not only was I pregnant then, and I think I was about, at that point I was about maybe three months pregnant, but we haven't right. been starting rehearsal yet. Right. This is just a little workshop before, till we started rehearsal like a month later or whatever it was. Or a month and, and a half. play all yeah. Yeah. the color. Ah, I'm suddenly doing the effect. arithmetic. Going, oh my God. Yeah. Because Nora can be many things, but pregnant is probably not, probably the, not the one. Right. <laughs> I think it would come up. You can't leave me. You're pregnant. Yeah. Um, but she, you know. I remember you said to me, I'm sure it's not a problem. You're a feminist. I remember you said that. To me. <laughs> Did I really say that? Yeah. Oh. I said, oh, no, we'll work it out. And you know, I did think, okay, if she shows, can I use that? What can we do with it? You know, I right. really did go, through, but then we decided, no, I think suspension it's better. Of, yeah, suspension of disbelief will swim show. and we'll ignore it. But also Jennifer von Meyerhauser said it was one of the greatest exercises she had was to like design these clothes and do all these tricks that she had, like um, things. She's a like, genius. She's a genius. And so things, uh, you know, I'm not standing up, but she would, she would put lines in the clothes so they would like create a waist where there wasn't one. And she said yeah. often, because she teaches a lot, she teaches costume design. And she said, it's an it's a, it's a assignment she always gives her students, you know. In this particular play, your leading actress is pregnant. How are you gonna hide it? So, and and uh, and I have to say um, that you know I had such great clothes in the show, and when I was ready to leave, because I think by the time we wrapped, I was like five and a half months pregnant, right? You were a little more, I think, because as you said to me, I could not do one more Tarantella hop. <laughs> yeah, um, no way. But but a woman who who ran your costume shop, who I don't remember her name anymore. When I left, when the show ended, she presented me with a beautiful little 19th century style baby hat made, oh. out, made out of my, my first act, you know, travel, you know, outfit. And she said, I felt so terrible building all these clothes so that we would all pretend that there was no baby inside you. So she said, before oh, you leave, oh. after leaving, I want to give you something that affirms that there will be a baby 
and something, you know, it was just so, so, so beautiful. Yeah. 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 Um, Cynthia included in the bio that you submitted um, uh, the, uh, is that you said that being directed by Emily is one of the high points um, really in your career. And that credit was not missed by uh, Donald S., who's joining us from Princeton. Um, I wonder if you could talk about your reference and, and deference in this sense. Um, and Donald asks, what, uh, what did both artists take away from that collaboration? You know, it's one of those things, of course, P I have, and not, I'm not, not even just talking about Sex and the City, I mean, even things that I've done on stage, uh, on Broadway or whatever, that people are much more familiar with. Uh, every time somebody asks me, like, what's your favorite role you've ever played? It is the one that pops right into my head. Oh, God. Um, and I feel like, I mean, Emily is such an amazing director, but also it is a great play. And maybe because it was the third time you had done it, Emily knew that play like the back of her hand. And so she was as much a director as a dramaturg, I felt like, you know, mm. that every, there wasn't a, there wasn't a line that wasn't um, examined. And uh, I just feel like it was so, um, I don't know, it was an extraordinary production and, and also so many wonderful innovations like the way Emily thought of the set. Um, the idea was, you know, it's always one set. It's the, it's, the, it's the front room. It's the, you know, the public room. But what Emily had was when Nora decides she's going to leave Torvald, I exited through a room and the whole set moved. For the first time, the audience was like, you know, completely taken aback. And so all of a sudden now this, the, the, the big scene in the play when, when Nora tells Torvald that she's leaving him and he tries to convince her otherwise was now happening in their bedroom and literally on their bed, which was, in, you know, for these, for, particularly Torvald, such a formal person to finally see him in private was incredible, but then also what that, and it was a small bedroom, but also yeah. what that allowed us to do is while we were then having our big scene, then there was uh, something was happening so that our entire living room was being struck. And that when I decided to leave, when I opened the door to the bedroom, kind of the curtain, if you will, pulled aside and I had a long hallway to walk through oh. to get to the front door. So it wasn't just like, you know, night mother, boom, <laughs> right? Yeah. It was like watching me leave the bedroom and then walk, 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 front door slam. I mean, it was amazing. It was amazing. And that was, and that kind of like that kind of innovation with the set design, it just speaks to how Emily understood how much, how important it is, both the private and the public are to these people. And we are sometimes we're in public moments, even that they're, that they're happening in a living room and people are formal and people are right. And sometimes that is stripped bare and it is a, a man and a woman fighting for each other and fighting for their lives and fighting for themselves, but with everything revealed. Wow, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, you guys in that bedroom just tore it up. Oh my goodness. So Nora's yeah, one of the great so roles, um, Cynthia, um, and I'm sure that um, part of the interrogation of the role um, involved um, the question that was, is asked by Jean L, who's joining us from New York City. She asks, why does Nora in a doll's house not want to talk it out with Torvald? Why does she not want to talk it out with Torvald? Um, I don't know if you ever have reached a moment in your life when you just see the path in front of you and it's just clear. And that's what happens to Nora. Yeah. Um, and she cannot be shaken from it. And, and it's so unexpected, but when she sees it, she can't unsee it. And also I think there is a way in which a, it, she's doing something very, 
very painful and terrifying and just difficult in every way. And you know, Torvald is a, is a lawyer, right? Isn't he a lawyer? Is he a banker? What is he? Banker. A banker. banker. I mean, Torvald is an educated person. Nora is not. She really doesn't stand so much of a, ch you know, she doesn't want the chance, I think, to be argued out of her decision. First of all, her decision is unshakable, but also she has to strike while the iron is hot. She has to leave now while she has, while she has the courage, because it's not the most, it's not the most rational thing that, that to do, but it is, uh, it, it is the the right thing, and she just has to to fly toward it. And and there is the power the power dynamic in their marriage is so lopsided yeah. that there is no there is no fixing it by talking out. There needs to be a revolution. There needs to be a personal revolution. And it's so clear to her. She tries and tries and tries and tries through the whole play to make it work. She's torn, made herself into what he wants her to be and to try to play the games. And she's been working all this time to save the family. And then when he discovers what's going on, how he responds to it, she can never love him now. You know, where you go he's to a point to her to the wolves after she's ready to sacrifice yeah. everything for him. Everything. He's ready everything. to throw her to the wolves at the rather than risk a scandal. Yeah. You know how sometimes someone says something and that cannot be unsaid or does something and you can't pretend you don't know they did it. And then that's it. You can't love them. You can't stay. You, that's it. And I think Nora saw it. And I think one of the reasons the play is so is so beloved is that so many of us know what that moment is. And when you really play it, as Cynthia did, it, it just blows an audience away. And that's what I think he wrote. And it's rarely done that way. I think also it freed us when I decided it should be in the in the bedroom, Cynthia. And I remember talking, I think it was Tom Lynch, the designer, and he went, oh yeah, then I said, it. I think it's also very small and the bed is, the, and she's going to be trying to pack and get, you know, but the bed is there. Yeah. Um, I don't know, somehow that just freed, it took, as, as, as Cynthia said, the, the private and the public, the, the whole body changes when you're in the bedroom and you're not in the parlor, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the emotional life, between you and David, I mean, he he just cracked wide open. And you would think we, you know, we do, we should feel for him. It's very sad. Yes. yes. It's very sad that he became the man he was. I mean, the society made them, it made it impossible to have a good marriage. And they should have, they should have. They should have. They would have been great in the wild, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, I think that's right. They were, there was passion there that you know there was no, a very funny a few years ago maybe 10 15 i don't know a few years back i was asked to do a reading of uh, an updated version of doll's house uma thurman was reading nora the nora character and i was reading the christine character and it was a film that they were thinking of making it like tribeca or somewhere and uh and at the very end they Nora was standing there listening to messages on her, I think, answering machine of like Torvald begging her to stay and the children and right. And she's like standing there and then like it ends. It was so amazing to me that like, that Ibsen was brave enough to have her leave, have her leave yeah. the children. But, you know, in the, in the, whatever that was, you know, aughts or whatever, so, so hard. Like, well, would she really, or maybe not for the, you know, for the kids, for the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and she wasn't just leaving him. She was leaving the kids. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, in the early days of uh, people doing this play, there were a number of actresses who said they would not play Nora if the children were on stage. Oh, right. Make them look too bad. Yeah. yeah. And uh, boy, did we have the kids. Yeah. 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 
it yeah. it rips her apart, but she yeah she goes yeah. Um, Emily, I would love for you to just talk about your experience of working with Cynthia and her um, abilities um, um, and sort of a, approach as director to actor and what you enjoyed about that experience with her. Well, like since one of the highlights of my life in the theater. So we'll start there. And so how do you break that down? Um, Magic sometimes happens between a director and and an actor, and and the re rehearsal room just chemically everything's working in a way that that makes everyone do their best work. And we had one of those. Um, um, Cynthia has it's so interesting. She she. Um, it's so, so weird to be talking about Cynthia as if she's not here on about her. So, I mean, I'm feeling so strange, but um, I guess because Cynthia is such a stage animal. I mean, um, you, I never have to tell Cynthia where to be on a stage. I mean, it, you know, she just knows where she should be and what she's doing. So there's, uh, sometimes you have to, uh, there's a lot of coaching going on. That was not what we had. We were digging and plumbing the depths of what, her Nora was, and at every moment and 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 microsecond of the play, what was really going on emotionally, physically, psychically, and everything else. And because I find you're uh, emotionally fearless, which of course is my favorite thing, coupled with an extraordinary craft. I mean, Cynthia knew how to use the language, knew how to use her body, knew how to. I mean. But language is so important because you, there are some people that if some actors don't have the training the way um, we did coming up, of different levels of heightened language, that if it isn't sort of television-esque and somewhat inarticulate, once you're dealing with the dense text, uh, some people cannot mind the emotional depths of it. it the, the language blocks them. Cynthia took it as a challenge and just did a deep dive, you know, word for word into it, moment for moment into it, and used the language to, you know, it became seamless. And that's um, both um, a great intuitive genius, but it's also craft and skill. So to have that melded into one person who's emotionally fearless and, and open and goes, oh, she's thinking about killing herself. This, oh, okay, <laughs> just, I'll go there and we'll try whatever it is that's going on. And then, you know, oh, well, you know, and then switch and change and keep going deeper. I mean, it's just was a magic, it was magic. And, um, you know, I've had that with a, a few people in my very long life in the theater and, Cynthia's, you know, makes me realize, 96, come on, we have to yes, do another exactly. one. Oh my so God. So many people Cynthia. asked, um, isn't it time? Oh, uh, it's so past time. But you know, <laughs> there were so many times, but Cynthia had babies and she yeah. had families. I mean, it's not as for a want of trying, but she kept saying, right. just do it in New York. Just do it in New York. <laughs> it, it's, well, now I can. I want to say something, you know, um, it's so, the thing that you said about, about using the language. Yeah. Um, a friend of, uh, a guy that I know uh, played the fool in Lear when Glenda Jackson did it. Yeah, in London, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And she hadn't done anything in like 20 some years. So, so shortly before, yeah. So I did Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with her, which I think was like, the second to last play she did before she left and was in parliament for 26 or eight years, whatever it was. And I said to him, it was because it was, this was before, I was talking to him before she brought it into New York. And I said, so how, how was it after almost 30 years being away? Did she have a kind of a learning curve? He said, what was really interesting is the British parliament is very different than our Congress. They are constantly, you know, arguing with each other in an incredibly visceral, erudite way. And so after arguing with people on the floor of the House of Commons for almost 30 years, 
her ability to convey meaning and emotion through language was as mm -hmm. sharp as it had ever been. But he said what the thing that she had to relearn was what it meant to be in a company of actors who have your back and who you can trust. Oh, that's so interesting. Because she had all the language still at her disposal, as disposal, but what she didn't have was the was the memory, oh yes, and these people are my tribe and my friends, and if I go up or if I trip or if something goes wrong, their impulse will not be to cut me and you know, kick me when I'm down, your impulse will be to lend me a hand and lift me up and pretend it never happened so that the audience doesn't even realize. That's amazing. So she had 30 years of an adversarial. Right, but, but where like the language was, was, the, was the medium. Yes. So that was still, right. if anything, sharper than ever. Yeah, it certainly was, yeah. 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 Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. You know, Emily yeah. was just talking about um, all the actors she's worked with in her 30-year 30 career, uh, 30 year career uh, or just beyond 30-year career, but her 30 years at McCarter Theater. Um, if anyone examines your theatrical resume, Cynthia, and your filmography on IMDb, you've worked with hundreds of directors on so many projects. I know why she, was, she wasn't available, Emily. <laughs> so do I. But I, what I, because you've worked with so many directors, you've been ex observing directors since you were 11. Yeah. And I'm wondering, when did your director's bell first go off? And how long did it take you to allow yourself to acknowledge that? And then how long to start acting? So, um, you know, it was really, I mean, I, 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 I probably don't seem this way, but I'm not a person who like, likes to take a lot of chances outside my comfort zone. <laughs> Um, so I had wanted to, I, had, yeah. I, 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 I know it doesn't look like that, but it's, no. true. Okay. but, um, but I had been wanting to direct for a long time, but I was just too scared to even try. And I thought, well, how do I, try? you know, where would I even, how small do I start? Um, so a few years back, I was doing a benefit reading for Scott Elliott, who I had been directed by and a few times. Uh, and um, I have a lot of opinions about readings because when I was a kid, I used to do readings, I mean, like every Friday at Circle Rep and nobody ever rehearsed and we just sat there in chairs and they were great, and, you know. So I believe, I, you know, you should sit, everybody should just sit the reading, people shouldn't stand up or come or enter, whatever. So it was the beginning of this all-star reading that he was doing, it was like a, about a, it was, I can't remember what it was called, but it was like a campy thing about a women's prison. It was crazy and hilarious. And he started telling us what we were going to do with the music stands and whatever. And, and I guess I just wouldn't shut up. And I had a lot of opinion. <laughs> and so Scott, who's a friend of mine, finally said to me, Cynthia, you know what's going to happen next year? Next year, you're going to direct the benefit reading for the new group because you're already directing this reading now. <laughs> and it was a good way to get me to shut up, which was good, but, um, but he actually meant it. And so the next year I directed the benefit reading and then we looked around and what, and, and I'm not, so of course it's very difficult to direct and it's, it's like one of those things that you could, you spend a, a lifetime or more, you know, as many lifetimes as you would be given learning how to really direct. But what I found when I started directing is that actually I was farther ahead of the curve than I expected. I'm sure you were. Because the truth of the matter is the way my mother directed me from a very early age, she sort of taught me to think like a director. And so when we would go see these plays when I was little, I mean, six, you know, Shakespeare, we wouldn't just see them, we would then dissect them mm -hmm. afterward and we would dissect what worked well, but more importantly, what didn't work and why it didn't work. And my mother always said that it's much easier to learn how to create theater if you examine a piece of theater that hasn't gone well, because then you can see the spine of it. Mm -hmm. And you see, right, you see, oh, if someone, it, when you see a, 
when you see a magical piece of theater where everything is perfect, you can't learn anything from it because it's seamless. And so I, I actually feel like my, my mother tried for years to be, a, be an actor, but I think she was really a director. A director. Mm -hmm. and, but it was, you know, she was in Yale drama in the 50s and the idea of her being a, being a director seemed you know, far-fetched. Very far-fetched. Yeah. And you know what's also interesting as you say that, Cynthia, that another thing that is extraordinary about you as an actress is that you see the whole. You do. You, you're looking at where you are in the whole. And, and that, to me, also is thrilling to work with as a director directing you. Because it's never just about you and your moment. You're, 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 all, you're also looking out, which is thrilling. Um, and seeing where the whole play is going. And, and that's, to be able to do that and stay with an internal life this is it's very rare it's 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 beautiful it's not at all surprised that you're going to be directing and that you're directing i i gosh if i was still acting i would want to be directed by you oh. <laughs> no it's true you gave an amazing you put it all together cynthia hmm? she gave an amazing reading of lady macbeth for our shakespeare community reading group so if really? you're on shakespeare i'm not oh, yes oh, oh, let, me, let me correct that macbeth and yes. lady macbeth yeah, so it was really good. Both, both roles? Well, well, so we were doing a community reading, so we sort of cast and recast, and we have people zooming in from all over, professionals, non-professionals, mostly non-professionals. And, and Emily entered the room and said, well, I'm not really an actor. And then like, <laughs> people's mouths were like, she was so good. Thank you. So, well, I had directed no, the I'm play. Not, so right. I, See, I again, knew, it was, she I knew the play in and out. So, it's yeah, she knew right. how to read it. Um, Cynthia, Jarrell H., who was a director and theater professor, uh, who's Zooming in um, from Chicago, writes, uh, I feel lucky that I got to work with Joel Drake Johnson in Chicago before he passed. And I wondered if you could speak a bit about how important it was for you to direct his play, Rashida Speaking. Yes, so Joel, such an amazing playwright, and I I hope that we we do more of his plays in New York. Um, Rashida Speaking was, uh, you know, the very first play I directed, um, and it was really challenging. But I think one of the things, you know, Joel wasn't young when we did it, and it was you could see how how a lifetime in the theater had um, taught him how to capture an audience, how to build success, and how to just mine the hell out of subtext. Like the subtext was mm -hmm. so, how, you know, theater that just makes you hold your breath because it's so tense and you're afraid of what's gonna happen um, next. Um, and I think that one of the, apart from his incredible craft, I think the, the thing that, that Joel did is as a white person, he, he really put himself out there and tried to talk about something from his biography that had happened to him, uh, a, 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 an unpleasant, uncomfortable thing that had happened to him and that, that caused him to examine his, his racism that he had been previously um, unaware of. And I think that was one of the things about, about Rashida speaking, was it, it kind of provided a conduit um, for, for people of different races to, you know, in post-show discussions and stuff, really talk about uh, misunderstandings, but also for, for, for white people to, who did not feel that they had any racist inclinations to sort of get a little bit um a little bit closer to that and i think uh yeah i think it was uh it, it's a really interesting play but 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 i wish we would do um more of his plays because i think they're they show so much craft um i'm gonna use Jarrell's second question as a the perfect place to pivot to the topic of um activism um he sets his question up this way 
I know the significance, historically speaking, of what it means to be an African-American director. And here's this question. Could you each speak to what being a female director in a world which seeks to silence female voices means to you? Or do you even think about it? Oh. Emily, why don't you? I think Emily, yeah. <laughs> I, it's very hard for me not to think about it. So. I think about it a lot. Um, some of you who know my my history know that I was told when I was um, leaving college, you know, thinking which way do I want to go? Do I want to become a film director and go to the West Coast, or do I want to go uh, in, and become a theater director and, and playwright and go to New York? My uh, advisor told me that women can't direct professionally, and that I should think about maybe going into children's theater. Nothing against children's theater. But that is not what I wanted to do. I had just directed a rather, I thought, very good production of Macbeth. <laughs> There's nothing um, about it. And my my uh, predilections at the time, those, you know, what I wanted to direct was very serious um, and, and a lot of classical theater and new work. So anyway, um, that was in the 70s. And I think Gloria Steinemann, the second wave of the women's movement every day for um, my being able to know that that was wrong. And though I didn't have any role models, I was going to do what I loved. And um, it took a lot. Um, I was often the only woman or first woman to direct on any main stage in the country I worked on all the way through the 80s. Um, and um, worked very hard uh, once I broke through um, in the night in you know on Broadway and then um, coming here to make sure that I gave opportunities to um, uh, the stories of women and people of color um, directors um, of color and women as well as playwrights and designers, and it was a big part of the mission of McCarter. And one of the things that kept me going for 30 years was how exciting it was to see these stories come out and these writers who had been given the opportunities to just do blazing and 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 nationally significant work. It was it was one of the thrilling parts of being here. So I think about it all the time. That's a short answer. Um, I think about it all the time in the plays I pick. I mean, I, I always only go with plays that I can't not do. And very often they're plays by and about women and people of color. Um, this just seems to be true. And yet on the classical side, you know, you certainly Ibsen, um, Williams, Chekhov, but when I look at them, they wrote great women. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, always know consciously that the choices I was making was about that. It's only when I look back and I look at the patterns that I see it's mm -hmm. pretty clear. Um, but Tennessee understood women, Ibsen understood women. I think I would have been madly in love with Anton Chekhov. <laughs> I would have been one of the many. <laughs> but I felt when I was working on him and I was doing you know, the translations and adaptations and then directing them, I felt I was having this incredible relationship with him. So, um, yeah, um, I don't know. I went off on a strange tangent. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, Cynthia and Emily, we're almost at time, but I wanted to know, not to pressure you, could we have a little bit more time together? Do you uh, have a little bit of time? Okay, great. Thanks so much for that. Um, Cynthia, could you talk a little bit about your own political formation and the roots of your activism? Um, and maybe a little bit about the first cause that inspired your public involvement? And um, yeah, let's start there. Well, so <clears throat> I, my, my parents were both fairly political, but particularly my dad, really. And uh, I feel like my 20s were so much about, about acting, and, and also my, my teenage years were so much about acting. Um, but I always had a, a, a political bent. I mean, I think I did my first 
NARAL fundraiser when I was 13. <laughs> my, my mother, when I was old enough, um, she told me that she had had an abortion when it was illegal. And she never, it was obviously a very, very awful memory for her. And so she would never give any details about it, but she always wanted to make it really, really clear that I understood that it had happened and she had done it and it had been awful. Um, and so I feel like when I was in my, my 30s, the first, the first issue that really, that I really stepped out on, other than, okay, so abortion and gay rights, I feel like were stuff that I had, had you know, been doing little things about and, and cancer because my mother had been a cancer survivor. Um, but it was really fighting for public school funding that, um, that I, I feel like my, the, the dad part of me, the, the really all the things that I, that come from him really started to come to the fore. And that for me, like, I love being an actor and I feel like being an actor uses a lot of your brain. But I have to say, once I got involved because of budget cuts that were citywide and that I was seeing the results at my Sam school, the kid that I was pregnant with when Emily and I worked together, who was entering kindergarten, when I saw those budget cuts and I started making, making speeches and I got arrested and all this stuff, um, being able to write those speeches and actually get down on paper and, and codify what I thought and what I thought the situation was and what I thought should happen, um, I felt like, wow, there is this whole part of me that's kind of been in the background that, that needs a little more oxygen and food. Um, so it was really, it was really that, I, I gotta say. And that still so much of the activism, for lack of a better word, that I do really is about my city and my state and wanting things like, like education to be better funded. It's the main reason I ran for, for governor. Um, so there was actually something in the act of writing and sort of writing your beliefs and writing your positions, right? So writing your script. Your yeah, I mean, I, I have to say when I was a kid, I used to think, oh, I'd like to be a writer. But I don't think I could ever really be a real writer because um, I'm just not a solitary person. I am just yeah. not. I don't think I <laughs> Emily. That, spend that much time alone every day. And so the great thing about speech is, is it combines writing and theater, right? You're gonna write a speech and then you're gonna get in front of a whole bunch of people and you're gonna deliver it. So where do you land on the thought, well, oh, so I'm gonna run for governor of New York State. <laughs> like, Well, they had been asking me to do it for quite a long time, mm -hmm. really. Um, because the fact of the matter is if you're actually in politics, in democratic politics in New York State, you really can't run against Andrew Cuomo. Um, so you need somebody, you need somebody from the outside. So they had been, they had been trying to get me to do it for eight years when I, when I finally agreed. Wow. Um, yeah. when, uh, Emily, when you heard that Cynthia was running, um, what, what did you think? <laughs> and then she texted me and she said, I have to talk to you. I thought, oh my God, how great. So she called me. I, I, I you know, wished I had the money to really um, make a difference, but I, I gave what I could. I emailed everyone I knew. I, you know, I did what I could for her campaign. Um, and I was working in the city. I, I, was it on Gloria? I, I don't remember what, which play I was doing. Yeah. And I watched your concession speech. I was bawling. And then I realized, oh my God, this is the most eloquent and beautiful and uplifting speech I could imagine anyone has given in that situation. And I think I texted you right away and you texted me right back. But I, yeah, I just was so thrilled. I also, knew it would be a pretty hard <laughs> hard road to hoe, but um, I, I, I stayed uh, uh, hopeful to the last second. Yeah. Yeah. Cynthia, I always you... wondered what you're thinking now. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you asked it. 
Uh, so, um, <laughs> you know, I have so many projects that I'm, that one day when we all get back to work that, I, you know, in the theater and in te television and film that I'm really excited yeah. about. So, yeah. I mean, that was one of the, apart from it being really hard to run for governor, uh, you know, it was hard to be away from the thing that I love the most, mm -hmm. you know, which, yeah. is, which is our, our, our business, our, our world. Um, Cynthia, could you talk about what you're most proud of um, having campaigned and if there's anything that you learned about yourself or politics that you're grateful to have pulled now that knowledge? I mean, I guess I, I have to say one of the, the main reasons that I ran was to say, think about what we actually really could do in New York yeah. if we actually had the right leadership in this two to one democratic state, this very, very, very blue state. Um, and I think we really painted a, painted a picture of that. And we also, we were part of a blue wave um, that year that got these, you know, IDC so-called senators out of, out of office. These were people who were elected as Democrats, but voted as Republicans and controlled the Senate and made sure all this legislation did not get passed. And the amount of things that we were able to do, the incredible housing legislation we passed last year, the, we, uh, the abortion uh, laws that we finally got codified, the, uh, the Green New De Deal that we passed in New York State, how, how far we went toward rolling back cash bail, uh, driver's licenses yeah. for everyone, including undocumented people, um, passing gender, uh, banning conversion therapy. I mean, the list goes on and on of what we could do and look what we did, what we did last year. So one of the things that um, I'm working on now is um, this slate of four really exciting um, BSA, D Democratic Socialist candidates um, who are running, one is running for the state Senate and three are running for the assembly. They're incredible people. One is a nurse, one is a public school teacher, one is a tenants um, advocate, and one is a, a housing counselor. They're all um, immigrants or the children of immigrants. They're, they're just an incredible force. And part of all the incredible housing legislation we were able to pass was led by, those, by the lone democratic socialist mm -hmm. um, in, in, in our legislature now. If we get this, this slate elected, we would have five. Um, and I think that this is one of the things that the pandemic is really, as Emily was alluding to at the beginning, the laying bare, not just how badly we need universal health care, but how, how lopsided our economic system is and how, uh, how people are just really living paycheck to paycheck. And, and we are so, so many of the people in power are so unwilling to to tax corporations and millionaires and billionaires, um, and we we have to we have to we have to create a revolution. Otherwise, we're going to get a revolution of the kind that we really don't want, right. you know. Right. Uh, and I think I think one of the things that running taught me was, you know, like so many things in life, showing up is a big part of it. But the other big part of it is is, fina is financing. And we have to pass, um, you know, matching funds like we have in the city. It's made an enormous difference here. And it, we have to um, make sure that everyday people can run. And the only way to do that is by campaign campaign matching funds. Um, and that's the only way we're gonna, we're gonna stop people from just buying buying seats outright I mean I have to say I was very glad to see that all of that money Michael Bloomberg spent got him exactly nowhere mm. and it's a and it makes me shudder to think of all that money that was spent and what it mm -hmm. could have been what it could have been spent on it's a collaborative I, I think you're showing politics as a truly collaborative effort and not just a solo performance yeah, yeah. so so uh, we're doing this from from tomorrow uh, not tomorrow sunday from 6 to 8 30 we're doing this raucous uh variety show telethon me and uh sarah silverman and john early and bowen yang and lorelei ramirez and 
um, Morgan, uh, I can never pronounce Morgan's last name, incredible people. Um, it's called You Had Me at New York. If you're on Facebook or you're on Twitter, you know, look at my page and um, in my bio, you can click on it and buy a ticket. Tickets are $15 and up. It, it, it'll be a great time and you get to hear from each of the candidates and, and also from Julia Salazar, the one Democratic Socialist who is right now um, in the legislature. And um, it should be a fun time and, and lift your spirits because I think this is one of the hardest things about all being so shut off from each other. Yeah. Is, uh, just feeling like we can't participate and we can't take hold of things. And it's, it'll be a great time, but know that you're, you're getting, helping these people powered candidates get one step closer to being elected and, and having, a, having a government in New York that really works for everybody. Cynthia, for folks that aren't on Facebook, is there a website? Um, you know, you could go to the, probably the DSA for the many. Um, so yeah. anyone that's interested can do that. Yeah, and well, and I'll give you a, maybe I'll give you a link um, that you could that you can post here so that people can can buy it again. So um, Emily, I'm going to drop my question of asking you about running for political office. <laughs> 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 but I'd I'd love for you to just talk about um, uh, as our sort of our final topic in winding down. Um, uh, so just before the COVID crisis mandated the shutting down of society, basically, and sheltering in place, what were you working on or looking forward to working on? How has the crisis impacted those projects and what unexpected blessings or opportunities have come out of this quarantining? Oh, wow, that's a lot. Um, let me try to unpack it quickly. Um, we were uh, in the midst of uh, my last season. The fourth play was just about to open, directed by my mentee and great friend uh, and colleague, uh, Adam Immerbar. It was a production of Sleuth, and it was absolutely brilliant. It was in the big house um, that Cynthia played, Doll's a dollhouse in. Um, and we were playing to standing ovations and we were beginning to sell very, very well. And one night we, we were in our third preview and 800 people were supposed to arrive and 300 people arrived. And uh, we realized, well, this, this, is, uh, um, this virus is a lot more serious than we had thought. We thought, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday that we would get to the opening on Saturday at least. Um, it, and then it went hour by hour when we realized Broadway was shutting down. We just all come back from London and been going to the theater in the West End and everyone was just saying it's under control. And clearly now the word was getting out more and more it wasn't. Then Broadway went dark, we went dark. And that was the last time I was in the building at MacArthur Theater. And I have been going there every day for 30 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I realized that, you know, I started to shelter in place and work from home. Um, I think, um, you know, I spoke earlier that there are many things that I'm learning about our society from this um, catastrophe, global catastrophe. Um, some of them horrifying and some of them wonderful. Some of the wonderful things um, are that I think I was rushing around too much and that my life needed to have a reset. One of the wonderful things is I think the planet needed a reset, needed a forced stoppage. And Cynthia and I were saying earlier before we were broadcasting, isn't it amazing to see there are blue skies over LA and Tokyo and Beijing. Um, uh, we've been doing a lot of things wrong as human beings on the planet and certainly been doing a lot of things wrong in our own uh, country and it's time to stop and look and deeply listen and deeply reflect um, and I'm hoping that a lot of positive change is going to come out of this forced um, this, this forced uh, time of reflection uh, some of the um, Native American healers who I have been um, uh, following online, um, 
are saying that the planet, the mother, our mother is speaking to us. And I find that quite beautiful that we got out of touch with the natural world and the natural world um, is screaming back. Um, and I do think, I see that there's a possibility that we can all come together on climate change, on uh, a more equitable society, on seeing that all people need health care. Uh, I'm actually thrilled. I mean, we see on the news so often just all the people who are flouting the rules and being horrible to each other. But then I look at the frontline workers and I look at the people in our grocery stores and I look at the the heroic acts of people and that they are also being thanked and recognized about their importance to our society. And I'm hoping that if, it's a big if, if we really listen to ourselves on what we've learned, we will make change, positive change. I'm hoping that. Um, but in the meantime, I worry about our profession. I think we're the last ones to come back in the theater. I'm worried about our beloved McCarter Theater. And though I won't be um, at the helm anymore, I hope all of you who are out there who care about um, continuing the legacy that you will, um, you will support us. Um, but theaters have been closed by plagues before and we always reopen, don't we, Cynthia? You can't keep theater people. <laughs> doing what we do. So I do believe, I don't know when, but it's not if, it's when. And um, when we come roaring back, we've all had a lot of time. As Cynthia says, she's thinking about all these great projects. She has me too. Good. I am writing too, and I'm being offered many things to direct that are thrilling. And um, I think that once we have had time to deeply think about them, they're going to be even richer and more important than they ever would have been without all this wonderful preparation time. And I think at that time also people will be dying to be back together and be together in a theater. I think they're going to throng once they feel safe. Uh, Cynthia, will, um, will the film industry and um, television come back first, do you think? Yes, I think so. Yes. I think so. Um, it's just, it's hard. I, I, you know, not only how collaborative even a performance is but also getting people to sit next to each other in you know by the hundreds or the thousands in in theaters um yeah i think we've got a little ways to wait till that can happen yes so we have something to look forward to in september a project that you have cynthia would you tell us about ratchet Sure. It's, um, so it's a Ryan Murphy show. Um, it is, it takes place in the just post World War II, like 1947 in the coast of California. It's starring, uh, Sarah Paulson who plays the nurse ratchet character from, uh, one of the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> cuckoo's nest. Oh my God. It's like a prequel. It's like, we all remember nurse ratchet and how, impervious and sadistic she was and opaque um how did she get that way what actually happened to her that made her such a tyrant um such a sadistic tyrant and who do you um, play i am her love interest <laughs> <laughs> um it's and it's 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 sarah and me and finn whitrock and judy davis and sharon stone and Sophia mm -hmm. Pinedo, and Amanda Plummer, and Vincent <sighs> D'Onofrio, and I can't even remember. The list goes, it's in it like it's, wow. it's amazing. It's an amazing list. Um, and that will be available on Netflix, correct? I, yes. In okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can, I just realized you can actually put like a little thing for Netflix to tell you when it's finally Oh, yeah. oh yeah. that's that. good. Yeah. Meanwhile, you, um, you directed yourself. Um, we were talking about the 24 hour plays. Uh, people don't have to wait to see you in something new. They can go yeah. to uh, 24, the, I think it's, is 24 hour plays.com. Yeah. 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 Or on Instagram, or right to see you in a project. Would you just m mention a little bit about it? It's really sure. great. 
It's really so great. It is. Um, so David Lindsay of Bear, who's an amazing playwright, who I performed in his play, The Rabbit Hole, in 2006. And we have not worked together since. I seem to have a, I don't know, that happens. Um, so he, out of the blue, he texted me <laughs> and he said, uh, hey, if I write you a monologue, will you do it? Um, and so I said, are you kidding? So, so he wrote me this wonderful monologue about, I don't want to give too much away. I hope you watch it. It's, oh. it's, it's delicious and hilarious. Yeah. It is so fun. Um, I just want everyone to know that's in the Zoom room, uh, our fabulous Andrea uh, put a link to the monologue right in the chat and I'm sure she'll do the same on Facebook. And I think she did a link also to the-, the She did. Sunday. Yeah, you had me at yeah. noon, so that's great. Thanks for that, Andrea. You're really on the ball. Um, folks, you definitely want to go um, watch this. You directed yourself. How, how did you do that it, for I this mean, particular medium? I mean, it's not, you know, it's- yeah. um, you, you've always been directing. It was, <laughs> I, I mean, think it's also one of the things about the 24 hour plays, it's like a three page monologue and I had a very short time to, um, to memorize it. Um, and luckily the person is very stressed out and stammering a bit in the, uh, in the <laughs> script. But also what I find so often is um, I did three takes of it. The first take wasn't so great because my kid was screaming in the other room. Um, and the third take, um, I had a funnier ending, but the second take, which was the first, really the first usable take, I thought I can sit here all day and just do take after take after take, but I know enough from working in film and television that the first or second take are always the best and then it gets too observed. <laughs> so I'm just like, I'm just gonna, gonna press send, so. I forgot to grab the name of this person. This is going to be one of my last questions. You were set to direct Jane uh, Chambers last summer at Blue, Blue Fish Cove. Oh, yeah. And of course, now that the theaters are closed, this is going to be your directorial debut for Broadway, correct? Yes. Will yeah. it, are we just hoping that it will still happen? I mean, we have to, there's, I think nobody knows. Nobody knows when Broadway is opening up again and also we were going to do it next season on Broadway, but of course there are all these shows that were yeah, closed yeah. down that we'll have to, so uh, you know, it's all very up in the air, but it's, uh, it's an amazing piece. And we did a bunch of readings in New York and Los Angeles, and we did a, a three day workshop that was just, yeah, was just fantastic. And the idea is it's eight women, it's eight, eight queer women and to do an entire, entire cast of all, of all, all queer performers, which, uh, you know, was so fun to be in that room. But I think it's also, you know, it takes place 50 years ago. And the level of, kind of closeted out in the world that these people are, it's now really amazing to see, to see the, the caliber and the, the level of fame of the, of the actresses that we had in it and how, just how the world is, has been transformed in the last 50 years. Well, we're hoping for it. When we come back, yeah. we're, we'll be so excited. Um, uh, our final wrap on this, Emily, is we just announced um, that you're going to be teaching a class. Yes. Would you like to? Yeah. Listen to this one, Cynthia. Go ahead. Go ahead, Emily. Well, it's it's a playwriting class, documentary theater playwriting class, and I uh, have there there are ten people in the class, and then it's unlimited number of auditors. And basically, I'm, I want it to be about COVID experience that um, you're having uh, with uh, someone close to you. And you will be taking um, interviews and working in documentary materials. And by the end of four sessions, you will have a monologue. It will be um, the documentary version of uh, What's in the Box, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe not as funny, but it's going to be a beautiful class. Um, em, uh, Andrea, you're the best. Emily, uh, Andrea just p posted the um, description of it and a link to that on the page. So if people are interested, um, please do. Please do it. And if you are auditing, I will make sure that I'm hearing from you via chat and answering questions and all that. So don't feel if you're not one of the 10 that you won't um, have a, a voice in the room. You will. Oh, I hope you. Our 
our friend Jarrell Henderson from um, Chicago, who asked um, some of our great questions, just reported it's already sold out in the chat. So sorry about that. Oh. But audit, audit, audit. Audit, You'll audit. have the experience. Um, Cynthia, Emily, I can't thank you enough for this time with you. Um, and audience, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for going over time, um, my wonderful friends. Um, McCarter Theater Center at Home will continue re to reach out to its audiences and communities through McCarter at Home programming. Every Monday, we'll share out information on upcoming virtual community play readings, live artists in conversation events such as this, behind the scenes interviews and archival footage from some of our favorite past productions. If you were with us for a few weeks, a few weeks ago with Dylan, we posted some uh, clips from our production of Baby Doll with Dylan. Um, so uh, as soon as you sign out of this event, um, and maybe even the amazing Andrea has put it in the chat, you can uh, link to um, the McCarter website to sign up for those uh, announcements. Um, thank you again, uh, Emily. Thank you again, Cynthia. It was a real pleasure to meet you. And spend this thank you. Time. Oh, thank you. What a pleasure. It was so great to see you, Cynthia. You too. Much love. Everyone be safe out there. Thank you. Thank you.